I mean even something more radical, something that's, that you see in the stories of the Old Testament, that many of the most basic elements of faith, the most fundamental narratives upon which the story of salvation depend, are not situated in the text, except in an ambiguous and coit way, or rather, to be more honest, uh, situated in, a tradition, in the text in a certain tradition of reading the text. And this is why there has never really been and can never really be a functioning Christian community that truly reads the Bible literally, not in the sense that we give the word literally today. Even these modern fundamentalists I mentioned, contre coeur, are not really reading the text of Scripture so much as using the text as the occasion to reiterate yet again the story that Christians tell of how things stand between creation and God. Uh, you see it right from the early pages of Genesis, where Christian tradition f finds correctly, in, in one way, a story about the one God creating humanity out of omnipotent wisdom, endowing them with a nature that somehow is a distant image of his own, and then about how the parents of the race, tempted by Satan, fell from communion with God through disobedience and bound all their descendants to the consequences of sin, original sin. But, of course, at the most leadenly literal level of the text, no such story actually appears in the text. I mean, if I say that, sometimes I get, it depends on what group I'm talking to. You, this isn't, I know, the Southern Baptist Convention, so I'm, I'm not going to get drummed out. But I, sometimes I don't think even those of us who know this don't know it <coughs> clearly enough because, it, because we, let it, we, we let it grow foggy in our minds. Once you get past that first creation account, <laughs> the Elohist narrative, the, that first cousin of the Enuma, Elish, beautiful, grand, full of radiant trumpet fanfares. You come to a somewhat more buoyantly mythological account, the Yahvist story, which is a different account. I mean, the order of creation is different. And we find ourselves in an element that is fabulous. Uh, you would even say fable at its most nimble and ironic at times. Uh, could even be called, a, 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 if you're reading it literally, a, a sort of droll just-so story, how the snake lost his feet. <laughs> but as written, it has nothing clearly to do with original sin or with spiritual death. The devil appears nowhere in the tale, and certainly the authors of the text had no intention of suggesting that he did. In fact, they certainly had no concept of the devil at all if we're really interested in reconstructing intentions. It's a rather ordinary sort of folk tale about how the chance at immortality was lost for the race due to a mishap or misunderstanding of a rather trivial variety and in part because of some very clever beast who outwits both human beings and gods. And I use the word gods quite intentionally because it's not even a monotheistic story. Uh, I mean, if we summarize the story, Yahweh, or let's say the Lord, uh, with paraphrastic fear and trembling, the Lord, all in capital letters, is the king of the gods. He plants a garden where there are two trees that grow. You might even say two magic trees, probably meant to nourish the god. The one grants them wisdom to discriminate good from bad. Not good and evil, but what's worthwhile and what's not. The difference between a diamond and a worthless pebble. And the one, fr and then there's the fruit that endows them with unending life. This is very, this would be very common things in Mesopotamian and other mythologies. Then he decides he needs a gardener to tend. He, and again, I mean, this, this is how the text actually tells the story. He needs someone to tend the heath and, heath and tilth and orchard, so he forms a little clay creature for the purpose, somewhat probably in the likeness of, of himself, as in the Elohist account, meaning looks like him, brings it to life with his own breath, sets the creature to work naked and abject, but not bright enough to know that perhaps he's being exploited, and then fearful lest the man should eat from the garden's trees, the Lord, to be honest, I mean, and this becomes clear later in the text, lies to him. It says it's a poison tree, it'll kill you. You eat it, you'll be dead before sundown. Now we, of course, allegorically, in our tradition, Christians, we see the story of spiritual death. That's not obviously what's on the page. And so rather tardily, the Lord realizes the man will need help in his work, so he goes about making an assistant for him, but he does it maladroitly at first. He starts creating animals and sending them to him, but none of them is, 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 can do it. So finally, he puts him to sleep, plucks a rib from his side, fashions it into a woman. Now the serpent, who's not work wicked and certainly not the devil, but only the most cunning of the beasts the Lord made during those early experiments of finding Adam, help me, knows the truth, and he shares it with Eve. Just 
for the sake of mischief, for maybe because it's revolutionary conscience uh, or revolutionary consciousness in its in its earliest dawn. He tells her the truth. The center, the tree at the center of the garden is not poison. It will open her eyes, give her the wisdom, the knowledge she lacks. And the reason that the Lord has hidden this from her is because he fears that if they should possess this wisdom, they might become rivals to him and the other gods. So she eats, she prevails upon Adam to do the same. The Lord makes his alarmed discovery of this. He curses the man and woman with perpetual toil, toil, corporal pain, death, expels them from the garden. The snake loses his feet. But why? And again, the Lord quite candidly goes to the other gods and confirms that what the snake was saying was true. They have eaten of the tree of wisdom, and now man is like one of us, knowing what's good, what's bad. He knows that the jewels upon the hill of jewels where, where, we, where, we, where we have built our mansions are, are, are to be prized more than, than the pebbles and the mud, so to speak. If he should now stretch forth and eat from the tree of life and become immortal like us, he would be a rival to our power. Now, I, I think we all know this, right? But we never say it quite that way. We never make ourselves confront literally just how unchristian, just how remote from the Christian story. The Tower, the Tower of Babel, another good example. We always we look at the text, we read it as a story about a human attempt to storm the heavens with, by building a great tower, except that's not what the text is about at all. The tower is just an incidental detail. The real story is about this terrifying new technology that human beings have invented, the brick. Because the brick means they can create great cities. And God's cities that have towers that will that rather than just little hovels on the ground, towers that reach three, four, five stories right up into the sky. And Yahweh is alarmed and goes to the other gods. Now, again, as I say, I don't know your tradition. I don't know if this is obvious or not. But it is sad that at the far, at, at the far end of modernity, a significant number of culturally deracinated Christians are committed to the impossible proposition. Not that these stories have profound depths of spiritual truth, which they do, read within their tradition, but that they're accurate historical records and they contain in a material form the theological meanings traditionally associated with them by Christians. In truth, historically speaking, the only communities of faith ever really to have approached the texts in anything like a fully literalist way successfully were the Marcionites and other proto-Gnostic and Gnostic churches of late antiquity. Marcion certainly took scripture at its word and believed that the meaning of the text lay in the plain, literal sense of its words. Hence, he found that Christ was largely absent from scripture as we know it, and indeed that that scripture might even have been testament to a god inimical to Christ. The Ophites noticed correctly that the, in the Eden narrative the serpent is not a deceiver but an enlightener. Now why am I going through this? I'm trying to get around to explaining something about uh, early allegory, uh, Christian exegesis of scripture. One of the more peculiar misunderstandings that I have encountered in the academic world regarding ancient allegorical readings and not only of scripture or of any other text is that the exegete who was practicing allegory, believed himself to be engaged in an act of decoding. That is, it was often assumed that readers proceeded as if the text were actually consciously composed as an allegory and it was the interpreter's task to, to reduce the tale to its hidden significance. Uh, now, this sort of exegesis had had its advocates at the esoteric fringes of Christian intellectual culture for some time, and in the early modern period, certainly. I mean, read Isaac Newton's scriptural commentaries if you have the time, and it would take a lot of time because they were immense. But you don't find any of that in patristic or medieval commentaries. Allegorim, the practice of reading otherwise, was not the reverse of, say, what the late Alexandrian grammarians were doing when they composed their atrociously dull epic poems on, say, the origin of the alphabet or the rules governing the use of the optative. <laughs> Pagans, Jews, Christians, and they did too. You know, it's funny. In 1204, Crusaders, you know, these rude Franks, come into Byzantium and destroy the libraries in Constantinople. So we lose 
most of, of what remained. There were, there were texts of Sophocles, Euripides, mm. Aeschylus, Laws. They didn't destroy any of the Alexandrian grammarians' work. That was in a separate life. That survived. <laughs> <laughs> we lose Sophocles, and we have Portantius, you know, telling us that the, the optative is like a winged dove which lands upon the ledge of the waking. Pagans, Jews, and Christians all understood that to treat a text allegorically was a creative, I don't mean invented, but creative and ideally inspired act, whereby one arrived at only one of an innumerable variety of perfectly true readings. Uh, Augustine states this pretty clearly in the Confessions. The reader of scripture is not really concerned with the intentions of the human authors of the text or what they understood themselves to be doing. Have you read, uh, have any of you read uh, Augustine's De Genesi ad Literum, Augustine's literal reading of Genesis? Right. Well, I think you'll notice that what he means by ad literum is not what we necessarily mean by literal. Uh, you know, it, it's not, he doesn't give it the full allegorical treatment in the sense that he's not always pointing to how it speaks of Christ. But what he finds at the literal level is quite often the literal symbolic level. It's, not, it's still, it, it, it's impossible for him to, to move to a level like what, say, fundamentalism at the, in late modernity is thinking of. Uh, and it, I just, it, it, it's, it's remarkable that authors' original intentions are something that remarkably few ancient persons seem to think worth considering. Um, that was simply not what they thought a text to be or what they imagined reading to be. Uh, nor was reading understood as merely the passive reception of something situated outside of the interpretive act. As Gregory of Nyssa said, if one does not read scripture in a philosophical fashion, one is reading only myths with contradictory narratives. And in most patristic commentaries, this is a rather common and rather casually accepted attitude towards the literal contents of the biblical stories. Origen, I mean, take Origen on the Genesis narrative. He's not saying anything provocative when he says that... Uh, You'd have to be a simpleton. One would have to be a simpleton to imagine that there could have been days before the creation of the sun or that God literally planted an orchard with physical trees capable of conferring wisdom or eternal life or that God liked to amble through his garden in the gloaming or that Adam could have hidden from him behind a tree. No one could doubt, he says, that these are, are tales that we read figurally so that we should extract by the wisdom of the spirit those mysteries that Christ would have us know not historical occurrences. And yet Origen is aware that the authors of the texts were not consciously encoding meanings into the text. And of course, Origen gives us that precious notion that everything incoherent, unseemly, incredible, or contradictory in scriptures, everything repellent to reason or moral intelligence at the literal level of the text, w though it be the intention of the authors of the text, serves for the Christian as the necessary scandalon the necessary stumbling block which should cause us to stumble and awaken us to the folly of treating the literal level as the place where the Holy Spirit comes to meet us in giving us the wisdom of Christ. 